Our next speaker is Jim Hodson on talking about the Zimmerman Telegram, Two Months That Changed the World. This session is sponsored by the Fort Worth Aviation Museum. Just so you know, we'll have a break after this speaker, but certainly go to the restroom if you need one. They're out the door to the right. Uh, as I said, this session is sponsored by the Fort Worth Aviation Museum, and they have poppy flower lapel pins out there at their table. Uh, that harks back to the In Flanders Fields poem during the war. Uh, Jim is from Chicago. We won't hold that against you, Jim. Uh, graduated from the University of Illinois with a degree in industrial engineering. He was a naval aviator with the Marine Corps, hurrah, uh, and has a master's in management that he obtained in 1976. In 1978, he became a pilot with Continental Airlines and retired after, I can't do math, but about 30 years. 34 years, yes sir. With 28,000 flight hours, uh, he helped found the OV-10 Bronco Association. OV, O is an observation plane, right? V is fixed wing, 10 I'm assuming was the 10th model of that. Uh, Bronco was an observation plane. Uh, it start, started a nonprofit association for that as an aviation museum in Fort Worth. So the Bronco Association operates the Fort Worth Aviation Museum that tells the story of how aviation has changed lives, the economy, and the culture of North Texas since 1911. And they have six, 26 warbirds right now? Wow. Jim is the executive director and chairman of the Bronco Association. He is a member of the Tarrant County Historical Commission and one of the original founders of the Texas World War I Centennial Commemoration. He lives in Grapevine. Jim will discuss the Zimmerman telegram and lead up to American entry in World War I. Let, help me in welcoming Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Use one there. Okay. I got one here, too. Okay. Okay, this one's going to help. Good morning. We're getting the technology worked out here. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about the Zimmerman telegram, two, uh, two months to change the world. But I look at history as uh, being on a train ride. And as we leave a station or leave an area that we're familiar with, as we recede from it, the details kind of disappear. And all that remains are just the major landmarks. And the First World War is a lot like that. So I thought uh, before we can talk about the Zimmerman telegram, what we're going to do is we're going to take a step back. We're going to go backwards on that train and try to take a look at what the landscape was like in 1917 and in 1914 and even before that. You know, Texas, uh, at the beginning of about 1910 or so, uh, was really still a coal and steam uh, industry. The, but the only thing that had changed since the Civil War was the introduction of uh, an expansion of some of the railroads. So it was, uh, it was really very much a, uh, uh, a changing time for us. So one of the first things we're going to look at is that from 1898 until 1934, we were involved in what's referred to as the Banana Wars. It was primarily a war in Central, uh, Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, it was predominantly the Marine Corps and the Navy. And uh, we were fighting for a lot of different reasons. Uh, a lot of it had to do with, uh, with protecting U.S. interests in those countries uh, from uh, uh, whether it be natural resources or whatever. Uh, let's see, and there was a, a doctrine that was done by the Marine Corps during that period of time, and it was called The Strategy and Tactics of Small Wars in 1921. Uh, that book uh, is in use still today in Afghanistan and Iraq. So from 1910 until 1919 was the, uh, the Mexican Revolution. And as you can see from uh, the outline of things here, there were a number of things started to happen. Uh, in 1910, we were deployed to the, uh, the U.S. Army was deployed to the border. Uh, 1913, the Army starts to build forts along the border. We had uh, forts, actually camps. Uh, at the beginning of 1910 or so, when the revolution started, we only had about six forts throughout the entire state of Texas. By the end of World War I, we had at least 24 installations. But we started building uh, camps along the, uh, the Mexican border. It says forts, but the difference is camps were considered temporary, forts were considered permanent. And then in 1914, well, in 1914, we had a little thing called the, uh, the Tampico Affair. Uh, Tampico Affair took place because of uh, a few sailors who were sent to get, uh, to get oil in Tampico uh, for the USS Dolphin. Uh, 
Uh, they went up a river past Carranza's uh, uh, soldiers and, and his territory and went into uh, Huerta's and were arrested. They were very quickly released when, they, uh, when Huerta's people found out who they were and what, the, what they were there for, but it, it uh, involved a whole big stir that took place after that. Wilson never liked Huerta to begin with. Uh, he didn't think he came to power uh, appropriately, as uh, Wilson would have uh, considered it. So they were uh, demanding, along with uh, Fletcher, the admiral at the time there, they were demanding that uh, uh, Huerta apologize and also uh, salute the flag. Uh, Huerta wouldn't do that. Uh, he made his apologies and he said that was enough. He wasn't going to dip the flag or, or salute the colors. So Tampico and what was going on there is there were a lot of American companies that were running the oil fields in Tampico. So a lot of what was going on was to, uh, was essentially to protect American interests or, or American economy there. Of course, the British were also interested in the oil because that was helping fuel their fleet. Tampico's waters were really very shallow. So uh, the government decided that, we decided that uh, we were gonna have to press the effort and Veracruz was the best place to do that. We also found out that there was a, uh, a ship, the SS Iparanga, that was heading for, uh, heading for Mexico with arms. German steamer, uh, a long time has been assumed that it was the, the Germans who were doing this. What turns out it was actually an American, uh, American companies in, uh, in Mexico who were purchasing Remington arms in the United States, and through a Russian broker, the arms were being sent over to Europe and then transferred to a German steamer and then brought into uh, to Mexico to support Huerta. Wilson didn't want that and ordered uh, Veracruz to be taken so that uh, the Iparanga could not, uh, could not uh, debark its, its weapons there. So uh, we stopped a boat on the high seas violating international law and then planted the flag at Veracruz. Uh, we were there for about seven months and it almost led to war. The Iparanga, by the way, left and went further down the coast and, and uh, uh, unloaded its weapons anyway. But this was all part of what was going on uh, during that time period and the activities across the border. Part of it was the, the plan of San Diego, which is uh, in San Diego, uh, Texas. And the, uh, the idea there was uh, to uh, uh, bring a revolt about within the United States and in Texas to, uh, uh, to take over Texas or take Texas back. Whether it was very serious or not, uh, the point is that it happened and it was used throughout the next several years as a uh, rallying point for the, uh, for the invasions, or the, the Mexican government and the invasions. From 1915, June of 15 till June of 16, there were at least 38 Mexican raids that took place across the border. So we needed to continually, after we, uh, we sent the, uh, the punitive expedition down, as you've heard, it was uh, mostly unsuccessful. There were some things that were successes and there was an introduction of a number of things. Armored cars and aviation, it was the first time the US uh, forces used aviation. It was wholly ineffective. Our Air Force at that point in time was a total of eight airplanes. By the, uh, by the time the expedition uh, came back, uh, there were only two airplanes left, mostly because it was so arid. The wood cracked and uh, there were a lot of things uh, that went wrong with that. But the airplanes were used primarily as communications with the, uh, the cavalry that had uh, far exceeded its, uh, its capability with telegraph. They found that the most important thing that the, uh, the aviation division brought to the battlefield were their trucks. They brought large trucks that were able to, uh, to haul supplies and logistics back and forth. Of course, uh, we lost at the, uh, the Battle of Carrizal. Uh, and, then, uh, and then withdrew, but also in 1916 and 17, the National Guard was called up. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, German troops were seen in Arizona, and also Japanese troops were seen in Mexico. And skirmishes continued uh, throughout, uh, throughout the First World War and into 1919. Victoriano Huerta, this is, uh, this is a gentleman who was a thorn in the side of Wilson, uh, for the, from 1913 through 1916. He assumed power, the presidency, uh, by uh, assassinating Maderno, which uh, was the big point of contention with Wilson. Uh, he had, uh, Wilson had a feeling that there was a natural evolution of the way government should change and it should come from within the people, and he had great disdain for, uh, for any of the governments that were uh, changed at the point of a gun. Uh, 
Of course, this was going on all across Central and South America where we were still involved with the banana wars at that time, uh, but that seemed to be different. So we were acting in a very imperialistic uh, way in some respects, and in other respects, uh, it was more nationalistic. From 1914 on, uh, the Germans, in one way or another, were offering aid to Mexico, whether it was to Huerta or whether it was to Carranza. Uh, the Germans were very active in that regard. In, 1950, in July 15th of 1914, after a lot of pressure back and forth, uh, Huerta finally decides that uh, he's had enough and he resigns and he leaves Mexico on a, on a German cruiser. He goes to, uh, goes to Jamaica and then from there ends up in the UK and then in Spain. Uh, he decides to, uh, uh, to return. Again, he's, he's, speaking with, uh, he's speaking with Germans when he's in Spain who are telling him that they will, uh, they will support an operation. And Huerta is, uh, is working with Pascual uh, Orozco uh, to have a new invasion into Mexico. So Huerta comes back into the US, comes back into uh, New York uh, only to find it, well, he didn't even find this out, but the British knew this was happening, and between the British and the Czechs and the uh, American intelligence services, they had the uh, hotels that Huerta was staying at fully tapped. So all of the conversations that, uh, that Huerta had with uh, um, Franz von Papen, or um, Redolin, in, uh, in New York were all taped. So we knew from a very early point in time that the Germans were trying to encourage the, uh, the Mexican government, whoever that was going to be, to either uh, help with arms or to help, uh, help in some way should war break out. Huerta finally leaves New York ostensibly to go to uh, San Francisco, but when he gets to Kansas he, uh, Kansas, he makes a big left turn and starts to head down to New Mexico. Uh, to uh, Newman, New Mexico, where he was going to meet with uh, Orozco, and they were going to plan their invasion of Mexico from there. The U.S. Uh, Department of Justice learned about this, and they arrested both of them on the spot. It took them to El Paso. Orozco escaped and was later uh, killed in a, in a, uh, a battle in Mexico. Huerta uh, stayed, in, uh, stayed in the U.S., and died under somewhat suspicious circumstances in, uh, on January 13th of 1916. Uh, there is a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of evidence to suggest that he had probably been poisoned by somebody. Now, we mentioned the, uh, the occupation in, in, uh, in Veracruz. Uh, this is the, uh, the ship right here. Uh, this is the, uh, the SS Iparanga that was detained at, at Veracruz. Uh, it was commissioned to, to bring arms to Huerta. And uh, there we go, April uh, 27th, 1914 is when we occupied uh, Veracruz. We planted our flag there, and we were there for, for seven months. In fact, part of our leaving was an understanding that none of the, uh, the Mexican citizens who had helped out the U.S. forces there would be, uh, would be harmed in any way. What took place in Veracruz is, is very interesting from a number of standpoints. This was the largest gathering of U.S. naval ships in the history of the United States. There were close to 100 ships that eventually ended up off of Veracruz. Half of the United States Marine Corps was there at Veracruz. The Marines found it very interesting there in Veracruz, by the way. They had, they had uh, fought in the Philippines. They'd fought all over Central America and, and in the Caribbean and places like that. So they found the house-to-house -house fighting in, in, uh, in Veracruz as their term. It was a very novel experience for them. So in addition to the U.S. ships that were down there, in addition to the United States Marine Corps that was there, there were naval ships from Great Britain, France, Spain, Russia, and Germany who were there in the area when this was all taking place. So it was actually quite a big deal that what was, uh, what was taking place down there. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, Smedley Butler, who was a, a Marine and who fought down there, uh, had, uh, by the time he finished his career, uh, in the 1930s, he retired as a major general, and uh, he was uh, very much a, an, an opponent of the way the Marine Corps had been used and the way the, uh, the U.S. government uh, used its military forces in, uh, in Central, uh, Central and South America. He, in fact, wrote a book called The, uh, the Racket of War, and it was uh, about the fact that we were down there not protecting our interests, but we were there being used as a police force uh, to protect uh, U.S. companies and, and uh, and their assets. Uh, this all began the, uh, the anti-American revolts throughout uh, Central America, and uh, this, this issue was settled uh, 
uh, by the ABCs. That's uh, Argentina, Brazil, and uh, uh, and Chile, and it was all settled in uh, in, Nicar um, in the Niagara Falls. But it took quite some time, and we were there for seven months. The punitive expedition talked about it a little bit, but it was a retaliation for Pancho Villa's raid into uh, Columbus, New Mexico. Uh, Carranza opposed the entire operation, our operation of uh, the punitive expedition. We mentioned aviation was introduced, and at the Battle of Carrizal, uh, we, almost, uh, we almost went to war with Mexico. Uh, part of the operation that was down there it was cavalry, and uh, this is another one of these instances where, uh, as in Tampico, where uh, it was a testosterone fight, and uh, it got down there, and, and uh, the cavalry, which was mostly the, the 10th cavalry, uh, was in place and wanted to pursue further down into uh, Chihuahua and the Carranza's forces were there and they said no you can't you can't go any further into Mexico and uh, a, a young uh, captain uh, in the army down there in the cavalry said oh yes we can and that started the battle which we lost and a number of the uh, the Buffalo soldiers from the 10th Cavalry were captured and were POWs for a period of time down there there was a joint high commission uh, between uh, the United States and Carranza, the government, and we met at least 52 times to avert a war. Uh, this only, uh, only increased the anti-American uh, anti sentiments, uh, but it did provide some experience for our U.S. Army. I mentioned the National Defense Act of uh, 1916. Uh, this was all part of response to uh, the, the Villa's uh, attack on Columbus, and it was referred to as the preparedness movement. Uh, increased the, uh, the, uh, the regular army by 175,000, National Guard by 400,000. It established the ROTC and the officers and enlisted reserve uh, corps. It created an air division and ordered 375 airplanes. In 1916, just to put that in perspective, that sounds like a lot of airplanes. During the war, France built 70,000 airplanes. Although we promised France that we would provide 20,000 airplanes, we never provided more than about 1,200. So 375 airplanes was nothing. And as we'll mention a little bit later, uh, our aircraft production, uh, what beginning, beginning stages were a disaster. Uh, this, uh, the act also allowed uh, Wilson to, to nationalize or and mobilize the guard, which he did. And uh, in uh, June of 16, Wilson called up 150,000 guardsmen for border service. Uh, initially, they called up New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas. And what they found is that the guard was, for all intent and purposes, there were excellent units and there were poor and, uh, and unacceptable units. When they came to Texas, they thought, Texas will probably be the most ready of all of them. But what they found out is that there had been a little operation going on in Texas in 1915 in which some of the leadership of the Guard had sold almost all of their arms and, uh, and equipment to the Mexicans. So, <laughs> so the Texas Guard was almost, uh, almost had nothing to work with when that started. Well, the Great War begins in 1914. Of course, Ferdinand and Sophie were assassinated. It was almost an accident if you know that story. Uh, but then Austria declares war on Serbia, Mex uh, Germany declares war on Russia, uh, Germany invades Luxembourg, and this just goes on and on. This is the classic domino effect. And then uh, at the end of all of this, uh, the U.S. declared neutrality. And, I, and I, as we can see as we're going to go on here, there's, well, there's different degrees of neutrality, aren't there? Labor relations, and this is some of the other, uh, the other part of the landscape that was going on uh, uh, during those war years. In 1914, manufacturing really increased a lot as the war started. We, became, so we started to supply all types of items uh, over to Europe uh, for the war effort. So manufacturing increased here. By 1915, more and more was going on and also there was labor unrest. People wanted an eight hour work day. They wanted to, uh, um, they wanted better wages. And over the period of the, of the war years, uh, the average wage went from about $580 a year up to about $1,500. So it actually increased quite a bit over that time period. But child labor laws uh, uh, were revoked, and so all types of different things were, were going on with, the, with labor relations. By 1916, it had gotten so bad that 
there were almost 4,000 strikes that took place in the United States during that time period. Uh, what it really started to do is it drew the federal government into uh, working with management and also working with, uh, with labor to try to solve issues. And in the case of, uh, in the case of this, uh, this headline, in Yorkstown, the plant, uh, Youngstown burning after riot. This is important to something else we're gonna talk about shortly, which is the uh, German sabotage efforts here in the United States. There was so much labor unrest of plants being burned and things happening that uh, when the Germans started to operate here in the United States, at first, uh, it was essentially camouflaged by the fact that there was so much labor unrest. Of course, suffrage, there was a suffrage movement going on at the same time, as well as Teddy Roosevelt, who was uh, all over the country uh, stumping for entering, entering into the war. Essentially, uh, sometimes I've heard this referred to as the uh, the, the movement to industrialize uh, democracy. The Dark Invaders, uh, Franz von, uh, von Rittlen. Uh, from 1914 to 1917, there was a very active uh, group of saboteurs here in the United States who were supported by the Germans. In fact, in July of 1914, July of 1914, the war started what date? August. So in July of 1914, and, uh, ambassador to uh, the United States, uh, von Bernstorff, uh, starts to build a, Stein, a spy network here. Wilson really liked von Bernstorff. He thought he was a great guy. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a very social, social person. He'd been raised in, uh, in Great Britain for the most part, but he was the ambassador here. He had a wife, he had a couple of mistresses. Uh, he was just kind of a man about town. What Wilson didn't know is he was also establishing a whole uh, network of spies. The person who was in charge of this was uh, Franz von Rittlin. He was the one at least settled in and did most of the work. They did a number of different things. Uh, keep in mind that when the, when the war started, of the 100,000 or 100 million people that lived here in the United States, approximately 10 to 11 million of them were German Americans. They were the largest ethnic group in the United States. Uh, many towns, especially on the East Coast, in fact, here in Texas, uh, the predominant language was German. Uh, the, uh, the street signs were German. Uh, the businesses were German. The newspapers were German. So it was a very, very heavy influence. The other thing that, we, that has been learned is that during that period of time in North and South and Central America, there were potentially as many as 500,000 registered German reservists here and in, uh, in, in uh, North and South America. Many of these people wanted to get back to Germany but, be, but could not because of the blockades. So in many cases, what the, uh, what the German spy ring started to do was create forged passports and things like that so that these officers could get back to Germany and get back into the fight. They were involved in bombings of businesses, fire bombings of businesses. They were involved in bombing ships. They were putting time bombs on, on ships that were going out to sea. They had plenty of people to help them because when the war started, we bottled up nearly 100 German ships along the East Coast, along with their crews. They couldn't leave. And so they were willing to help in any way that they could. We also had the Irish Americans who had no love at all for the British. So what was happening is uh, time bombs were being built uh, mostly in, uh, in New York and New Jersey, and they'd be placed on the ships by, uh, by Irish American stevedores. The ships would go off to sea in two or three days or a week later off into, uh, into the Atlantic. They'd catch fire and burn. Some would sink, some not. But hundreds of ships were affected this way. They were also, I mentioned the land bombings. They were, uh, they were bombing, uh, bombing businesses. Germany knew from before the war started that they had to keep America out of the war. They had to do that any way they could. They knew that if nothing else, America was going to be an economic engine that was going to be able to pr uh, produce goods and supplies. So they wanted to do whatever they could. Uh, von Rittlin and his group would oftentimes uh, buy up munitions, uh, put them on ships ostensibly to go to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to Russia and places, and they'd get diverted and they'd end up in Germany. Uh, one of the other things that, uh, that they did was, was union tampering. Uh, already mentioned all of the different unrest that was going on with unions. Very few, if any, unions were able to pay strike benefits to their, uh, to their workers. So a lot of the strikes were ineffective. So uh, von Rittlin and his group were setting up labor unions across the United States, and the one big benefit that they were offering was that they were paying you while you were on strike. 
uh, one of those uh, one of those unions operated down in Galveston on the uh, uh, on the waterfront there. And then maybe the uh, the one thing where germ warfare uh, came into play. When the war started, Germany had approximately 800,000 horses. Great Britain had about 80,000. France had about 130, 140,000. The United States had 22 million horses. So we began shipping horses to, uh, to Europe at the rate of about 1,000 horses a day. And some of the Jap uh, German saboteurs started infecting those horses with anthrax before they would leave the States. So this was uh, in, 19, in May of 15, the U.S. begins wiretapping operations. Most of, the, uh, most of the detective work that was going on regarding the spy ring was actually the New York Police Department. Uh, it, it got to the point, too, where one of the saboteurs uh, was, uh, was very, uh, very enthusiastic about the idea that he needed to do something about J.P. Morgan. We've heard that name. So he goes into, uh, he breaks into J.P. Morgan's house and attempts to assassinate him. Uh, he was not successful with that. The day before that, however, he went to the U.S. Capitol building and, uh, and set off a bomb in the Capitol building next to, the, next to the vice president's office. Wilson knew about most of this, but he told law enforcement people, don't let the newspapers know about it. He didn't want the U.S., uh, the, the people in the United States to know about what was uh, going on within their midst. Uh, this kind of came to a head in uh, July with the Black Tom fire. Black Tom was a munitions factory in, uh, in New Jersey, and uh, they were right there on the waterfront and, uh, and blew the plant up. Uh, and they found diplomatic, uh, the, the diplomatic files, uh, Von Rittler or one of his people, the way they, they discovered this is he was on a subway in New York with his briefcase, and he'd been being followed for quite a while by, uh, by the police. And uh, as some of us have probably done on a bus or a train or whatever, uh, not off, go to sleep, only to wake up and find out you only miss, almost missed your stop. Uh, this gentleman jumps up, realizes he's almost missing his stop, jumps up, runs off, and leaves his briefcase. And the New York detective grabbed the briefcase. And uh, so that's how they found out a lot about this information. Uh, spies begin to be arrested on Inauguration Day. And uh, soon after that, the German agents leave, uh, leave the U.S. And in June, of 17, June 17th, the Sedition Act is enacted. Because there were no laws to prevent any of this at that time. If they found somebody doing something that was an illegal act, that was one thing. But fomenting revolt and things like that were not illegal. So foreign trade, talked about this a little bit. I always like this little sandwich, uh, sandwich board man here. On the one side, it's uh, uh, peace on earth, goodwill towards men, and on the back side, it's uh, uh, war munitions for sale, orders filled promptly. Uh, the U.S. exports, uh, because of the blockade, and, and this is where the neutrality thing gets a little bit interesting, I guess, because we were sending all kinds of supplies to the British and the French, French and we said, well, we couldn't do it to the Germans because the British were blockading us from doing that. We were sending coal and oil. Um, the Fort Worth stockyards in 1917 was the largest livestock exchange in the world. In the world. Uh, we were sending horses and mules to the tune of about a thousand animals a day to Europe. Timber from East Texas was being cut, put on ships that were been, being built in Orange, Texas and being shipped to Europe. Cotton, of course, out of, uh, out of Galveston was going over in addition to other places. Food was being sent and ammunition and arms. Uh, Bethlehem steel uh, almost uh, increased in size by tenfold. Uh, along with a lot of other businesses because of the munitions that they, were, uh, that they were building and sending over. By the end of the war, it was like three million rifles and just untold numbers of other, other supplies. Uh, the American industrial production increased by about 32%, just huge, uh, uh, while the GDP increased by 20%. So then we've got uh, some figures here for, the, uh, for the, the exports in millions in 1913 and then again in 1917. And a lot of these numbers are subject to, uh, to revision and change. There's just uh, uh, so much information and uh, some of the sources aren't that good. So ships lost by U-boats. This was another thing that, you know, Wilson had talked about uh, uh, looking for that overt act for us to be able to go into the war. Well, the Lusitania, of course, in 1915, and a lot of people will say that that's what started the war, uh, there were an awful lot of other ships that had American, uh, American casualties on it that happened after that. By the way, does anybody know that one of the propellers from the Lusitania is up in Dallas? Yeah, yeah. okay, good. Uh, 
just a little trivia. Williams Jennings Bryant left office right after the Lusitania because he felt that there had been collusion between Churchill, Morgan, uh, Wilson, and House uh, to uh, maybe leave the Lusitania unprotected. In the case of all of these ships that were sunk, the Germans considered them a valid, uh, valid target and because virtually every one of them were carrying some type of supplies. They were carrying munitions, they were carrying money. In the case of uh, the Laconia, it was carrying $300 billion in, uh, in silver. Well, we're gonna move on here quickly. The unrestricted U-boat warfare is what started to change things a lot. Uh, the U-53 uh, arrived in Newport, Rhode Island one day. Just popped up, showed up right there in the harbor. Primarily to show people that even though their cables were cut and other things were happening, they could still provide information. And so U-53 is interesting because uh, when you go back, uh, the USS Housatonic, which was out of Galveston, uh, was sunk a few days later by the, uh, uh, by the U-53. So finally in 53, while Wilson was waiting for the overt acts, all of these other ships were being taken down. There were three more boat attacks. Wilson finally asked his cabinet what they think. They all vote for war. And then uh, Wilson, uh, Wilson asked uh, uh, House what he thought. House said they should go to war. Wilson finally goes and asks Congress. So then the, the, the Zimmerman telegram. Um, interesting because a lot of people think that it was just this one-time event that it happened, uh, happened in February, in January, uh, January, and that uh, this was all a big surprise. Well, from 1915 on, Germany had been talking to Huerta or Carranza or people in Mexico about support for the U.S. So by October 16th of 16, uh, Germany offers support to Carranza. Mexico offers, uh, offers bases for the U-boats. And then finally, in uh, January of 17, uh, the Zimmerman telegram is sent to uh, von Bernsdorf via U.S. cables. We were neutral, so we were allowing the Germans to use our diplomatic cables to send messages. The Zimmerman telegram came across that. The British, of course, had intercepted on the 19th, had intercepted the telegram, but they didn't want to let the U.S. know about it because they didn't want the Germans or the U.S. to know that they had intercepted the code and that they had broken the code. So they, they, they went through this, uh, this routine of trying to figure out how to get the code or the telegram to the U.S. without them knowing that they had broken the code. They finally went through Western Union and, uh, and in Mexico purchased a copy of the code, which had been sent from, uh, from uh, Washington to Mexico, but it had been the old code. There were two codes involved here, and this was the older code. Uh, Wilson... Uh, the U.S. and Wilson uh, were made aware of it in February 24th and 25th, and on the 29th it was published. And uh, what happened here is that the, the British used the ruse to show that the, 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 uh, the telegram had come from Mexico. There was a big furor in the newspapers about it, and it really started to tip a lot of people who were anti-war into it. What infuriated uh, uh, Wilson more than anything was not the telegram itself, but was the fact that they had used, uh, used our uh, U.S. cables to transfer that, that message. And Zimmerman on March 3rd said, yeah, it's real. And he was very matter of fact about it uh, to the Germans. In fact, Zimmerman had never really seen the telegram. It had been done by a staffer. And Zimmerman thought it was a good idea. The staffer had put the missions together and it had gone out. And as far as Zimmerman was concerned, he wasn't advocating that Mexico attacked. He was just saying if America entered the war, if. He was just creating another alliance. As we see, that's what started the whole war to begin with, where the alliance is all over the place. So the Allies were under pressure. We've talked about this a little bit, and uh, I'm going to speed through this somewhat. But J.P. Morgan uh, and was financing the British and the French to a large degree. Wilson knew about this, and he told Morgan, he said, don't put any of these loans in writing. We were neutral, so the U.S. government couldn't really make loans. But private parties could. So Morgan was involved with some other bankers and they were doing commercial loans uh, to the British and to the French. Uh, in January, he becomes a purchasing agent. And then, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Bryant resigned because of uh, what he considered to be collusion. Uh, the, the conditions in March of 17 uh, become so bad that uh, the U.S. needs to provide treasury grants. And in some cases, uh, uh, 
uh, Morgan and some of the other folks are concerned that uh, they will never get their money back that they've been uh, lending. Meanwhile, in Europe, uh, the people are starving, and it's not just the, the munitions and things that are going over, uh, but the entire economy is starting to collapse. In, in July of 28, the War Industries Board was established, and this helped uh, to uh, uh, purchasing supplies and quotas. This was just the first agency of nearly a thousand agencies that were uh, that were uh, invented or started and created by the U.S. government during this period of time. Uh, the United States Railroad Administration, again, this was another one of these administrations, and it was brought together to try to optimize uh, the railroads and how they could, uh, they could function and bring supplies. Uh, when the German U-boats uh, started uh, sinking the ships with their unrestricted warfare, uh, the ships were being bottled up into New York to the point that the railroads were also being stalemated up in, New up in the East Coast because the, the, the supplies were getting there, but they couldn't be offloaded onto ships because the ships were in port and they weren't leaving to the point where in some cases people were running out of food. And then in 1917, Russia leaves the war. That left a big hole in the entire operation. Uh, you see, they, uh, they just uh, simply abandoned and walked away in many cases. A lot of the oil that was being used was coming from there. Anybody here from Ranger? No? Ranger's very interesting because in October 27th of 17, uh, they discovered the, the, big, the big oil hit in Ranger. And if you go to Ranger today, you can buy a book from their historical society, which will tell you in no uncertain terms that Ranger won the war. <laughs> so this is essentially what it looked like during that period of time. If we kind of bar graph it out and try to look and see how everything took place and how uh, things lined out. The Zimmerman telegram was only a small portion of what was taking place in the world at that time. There were many other factors that were pushing us uh, into the war, whether it was the economics uh, that were taking place or whether it was uh, any number of other factors. But we tend, to, we tend to hook on to the Zimmerman telegram as being the reason that the war took place when in fact there were, I think there were quite a few other reasons for that. The Zimmerman telegram is just an easy place and that's what we teach in school that the, easy, that the Zimmerman telegram is what brought us into the war. So I'm not going to read all of this, but uh, in Wilson's Flag Day speech on June 14th, he outlines the reasons for going into war. And if you just read through some of these, these are excerpts. It's, we were forced into war because the Imperial German government left us no choice, denied us the right to be neutral, uh, filled our unsuspecting communities with vicious spies and conspirators. Their agents spread sedition amongst us and sought to draw citizens away from us. Some agents were men connected with the official embassy of Germany. They sought violence to destroy our industries and arrest our commerce. They urged Mexico to take up arms against us and draw Japan into a hostile alliance. They denied us the use of the high seas. Much as we had desired peace, it was denied to us and not of our own choice. So there's very little in there about the Zimmerman telegram, mostly about some of the other things that took place. And that's my take on it. Have time for a couple of questions. Oh, was that good, huh? Okay, fine. <laughs> See you all later. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. You bet, Mark.